Hi everyone, and welcome to our Facebook Live, uh, streaming across the country and uh, for all the way from Toulon, Manitoba. Uh, it's a nice day out here, and uh, spent the morning actually in the city, uh, running, doing some personal errands, and um, getting some building materials for my grandson. We're going to build him a uh, tree house, so something that uh, looking forward to doing with him. Now, um, it continues to be quite busy, and I know there's a lot of information here to cover off over the next uh, 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, there's been a lot of questions that have already come in, uh, both by email and uh, by the comment section on Facebook Live. Uh, again, I encourage everyone that wants a question uh, addressed uh, to throw it up uh, on the comment section on the Facebook Live page. And Megan, who is uh, quarterbacking the show um, in Ottawa, will uh, get those questions to me. Now, uh, you know, we continue to deal with uh, a local issue here, uh, one that's important to Manitoba, but it's, it also has implications uh, in both the Pacific and Atlantic coasts. Uh, and that, of course, is the long awaited uh, fish harvester benefit program that the Liberals announced way back on May the 14th. And our commercial fishers, including right here uh, in Manitoba, and we do have, like, a, a, for those of you that aren't familiar with, with uh, the riding that I get to represent, so probably in the House of Commons, Selkirk, Air, and Lake Eastman, we have both Lake Manitoba and Lake Winnipeg and Lake St. Martin uh, uh, in the riding. And those were, that lakes are home to uh, commercial fishermen and their families. And uh, those uh, fish harvesters uh, hold uh, often numerous licenses. Uh, Lake Winnipeg is a three season harvest uh, uh, fishing uh, season. And that uh, enables uh, people to earn a very good living out of sustainably producing uh, walleye, which we also call pickerel. Uh, pike, uh, which are also jackfish. Uh, they catch a lot of whitefish, of course, especially in the North Basin. And uh, sauger, mullet, uh, tulipy, uh, carp. There's a number of other species that are utilized, especially um, uh, the higher value uh, eating fish like perch and sauger and, and uh, pickerel. The government has refused to um, roll out the announcement. Uh, they're really good, you know, Justin Trudeau is great in standing in front of the cottage and making all sorts of announcements and promising to spend all of our taxpayer money, uh, but he hasn't delivered on actually getting the dollars into the pockets of our commercial fishing industry here in Manitoba or anywhere else in Canada for that matter. Now, uh, I don't often work with uh, members from the NDP, but Nikki Ashton and I do have a, a cordial relationship and uh, when it comes to um, local issues that impact uh, our, our riding, and, we, and she does border me on the north side of my riding, and uh, the north basin of Lake Winnipeg is in her riding, uh, and she has a number of other lakes um, that are also um, have vibrant commercial fishing activity on, uh, we decided to team up. So we sent a letter to the Minister for Fisheries and Oceans and Canadian Coast Guard, Bernadette Jordan, back on June 22nd. And we didn't hear anything for a month. Uh, we held a press conference uh, a week and a half ago uh, on July 10th uh, here in Winnipeg in front of the ledge. And we invited in our commercial fishing uh, industry. And uh, we need to keep in mind that two thirds of the commercial fishers in uh, Manitoba are indigenous. Uh, and uh, this is their main paycheck. And so they all came uh, down as well uh, to, to stand in front of the cameras and to demand of the Liberal government to actually finally deliver the program. And then just yesterday, we finally got a response from Minister Jordan and it was ridiculous. She has absolutely uh, made no commitment to any timeline to uh, putting the program out there so commercial fishers can actually uh, start accessing the program. You know, that has devastated so many communities that are dependent upon these commercial fishers being out on the lake, uh, bringing home their catch safely, 
uh, hiring local people to help with the processing of that fish, but especially helping with the catching of it and, and landing that catch, uh, going out there and you know doing the hard laborious work of uh, picking uh, fish out of nets. Uh, and um, unfortunately, there is just absolutely no commitment from the Liberals. Uh, I know that they have an over um, active interest uh, in other segments of our society, uh, you know, students to say the least, as we get, and we'll talk about the WE uh, charity scandal in a minute. Uh, but, you know, you got to remember that, uh, that there's the Atlantic fishery, which often gets uh, the, the, the most attention. Uh, but there's also the Pacific salmon industry and the halibut industry that's out in the Pacific coastline. Uh, but then, you know, often forgotten is the freshwater fishery on the Great Lakes and here in Manitoba on our Great Lakes, Lake Winnipeg and Lake Manitoba. So uh, I'll work with whoever it is to get the job done to take care of uh, my constituents, take care of our commercial fishers and their families. And, uh, you know, they are the ones that uh, so many communities rely upon, just like agriculture communities rely on the farmers. Uh, we have to be there to stand up uh, and support them as they have more and more difficulty in getting their wonderful uh, freshwater products uh, to market, uh, especially with, you know, borders shut down in the states, which is the number one buyer of our high valued uh, pickerel. Now, uh, I want to say hi to Bogdan. Uh, Bogdan used to be uh, uh, an Ukrainian intern in my office, uh, now lives in the United States. So uh, great to see you and uh, hope you're staying safe and healthy, my, my, my friend uh, down in the United States. Um, and I hope uh, Married Life is treating you well. The uh, other thing that, that came out of the news this morning, and we've already posted this, is that uh, we're starting to learn more and more about the timeline of when the government actually knew about the COVID-19 pandemic outbreak in China and how long they sat on it. And so back on May 5th, uh, we already had an information that the Canadian Forces Intelligence Command uh, and their special medical um, subunit that does medical intelligence was, uh, had learned already in, in January that there were uh, cases that the Five Eye Partners uh, realized right in the dying days of, of 2019 that something was up in, uh, in, in uh, the Wuhan province and, of, of China and that there was a cover-up. Now, I asked back on May 5th, you know, had Minister Sajin been briefed, he, all he would talk about was, was January. Uh, and uh, then we did learn uh, in my follow-up questions that he couldn't ha handle them, that uh, Minister Freeland actually jumped in and said that they had um, a cabinet committee meeting, a special cabinet committee meeting response team, uh, have a discussion on this uh, around January the um, 25th. Now, the, the, the strange thing in all, all that is uh, you know, we asked a question, what's called a question on the order paper, and uh, we got the response back yesterday. And so it turns out that Sajin was briefed on this January 17th. The first time that government officials and cabinet actually did meet on this was January the 27th. So this information sat on someone's desk or wasn't dealt with in a serious manner, either by Minister Sajin or somebody in the PMO for 10 days. So they sat on their hands for 10 days, you know, uh, and, and, you know, just imagine how many lives could have been saved if they started reacting quicker because they didn't start even moving to shut down borders until March. Uh, so, you know, they, they, they didn't take this threat seriously. They didn't see how this was going to, you know, devastate our economy. They didn't see how it was going to uh, completely uh, invade and destroy um, our, our long-term care facilities, especially in, in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, but we also saw it in Alberta and BC. Um, so, you know, they completely dropped the ball uh, on this. And, you know, it, it just leaves you shaking your head uh, as to whether or not they were trying to appease China or were they just completely incompetent. Now, you know, this is, again, 
a sad ca case of affairs. You know, we we know that WHO dropped the ball on this. There, there again is time lag from when people actually started to hear about it, that military intelligence were already sounding the alarm bells and certain countries uh, didn't respond. And, and you know, there's no doubt that Canada could have done much better with stronger leadership, but we don't get that with Justin Trudeau. We don't get that with Patty Hadju, and we definitely aren't getting it with Defence Minister uh, Hart Sajan, who um, didn't push on this heart, you know, right off the bat. As soon as he, uh, military intelligence started telling him uh, his his job as minister was was to get in front of the prime minister, and in front of um, you know Bill Blair as public safety minister, in front of Patty Hadju, and say, okay, we have to act. Something's going on here, uh, and we need to follow best practices. Well, how long did we wait till they even started saying? you know, shut down the border, you know, they're just started monitoring airports and international flights from China, um, not good enough. And as this evolves, and as more information comes out, uh, we'll see exactly how uh, Justin Trudeau and his Liberal government um, mishandled this. It cost Canadians their lives, and it's costing a pile of people uh, their, their savings, uh, their businesses, uh, as we watch more and more people claim personal and business bankruptcies. Uh, well, <laughs> switch gears a bit. Let's talk about this We Charity. You know, here we are again, another liberal scandal. Uh, it, and, you know, I, I got in, into the House of Commons back at the tail end of the sponsorship scandal. And this here uh, resembles that same sense of liberal entitlement, that liberal corruption, and, you know, essentially uh, this unethical uh, culture that just permeates throughout the uh, cabinet. Uh, and so, you know, this time we got Justin Trudeau versus uh, Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin. You know, we really are lucky that it was conservatives that started to ask the questions, the media that did actually uh, start sounding the alarm bells, that there was something incredibly wrong uh, with this contract. And so money wasn't spent. Dollars didn't flow into the hands of the We Charity Foundation. And so taxpayers aren't uh, left on the hook for this. But everything else in this even stinks worse than the sponsorship scandal. Because this is about helping a few liberal insiders at the We Charity Foundation. That they were going to benefit to the tune of over $43 million to administer a $912 million program that the public service should actually be administrating. So, you know, when you start going through this and you've seen the conflict of interest that, you know, uh, you got Bill Marneau that has been tied to the We Charity. He's re received compensation for travel. His daughter works there. We got Justin Trudeau, that both his wife, his mother and his brothers have all been compensated for speaking fees. We know that Justin Trudeau, you know, when he first got elected as leader of the uh, Liberal Party, when they're the third party, uh, was uh, receiving speaking fees. He even got paid to speak here in Selkirk Inner Lake Eastman at the Selkirk High School um, back in the day before he became leader. And he had uh, earned, you know, uh, somewhere around $255,000 uh, from the time that he became a politician to the time that he became leader of the Liberal Party. Um, you know, so he was doing quite well for himself, uh, uh, taking in all these, these speaking fees. Well, we know that between his, his mother speaking at, at 28 events, she received $250,000 to speak at WE. And um, these, these, this WE charity uh, really have a very tight relationship with Justin Trudeau, Bill Marno, and the Liberal Party. And uh, you have to question um, their own ethics. And as more and more uh, news comes out about the shell game that they're operating in multiple charities and organizations and contract services that all go back to the family that, uh, and the brothers that operate the We Charity, um, you just have to wonder, you know, where is this charity at and actually delivering what they say they're gonna do. The We Charity Foundation, which is the one that is particularly contracted uh, or was supposed to have the contract with the uh, federal government uh, actually had their, uh, their, their 
that that particular foundation only got registered as a charity a year ago and has no activity and the, the, the original purpose of that charity was to, was to be a, a land or property owner for the weed charity so what is the land holding company of the weed charity doing operating a, a, a student volunteer program that was going to pay volunteers you know somewhere around 10 bucks an hour so you know it's just again that you know marno forgot you know that he got paid forty one thousand dollars and in receiving uh reimbursement for trips that he and his family has taken off or we over to, to europe and elsewhere uh forty one thousand nah, dollars he just forgot about claiming that with the ethics commissioner you know we're supposed to as soon as we have these things happen where we have sponsored travel we're supposed to repart those back in 60 days and uh you know bill marno uh forgot to do it but you know is it any surprise he's already been found guilty by the ethics commissioner uh for failing to register all of his properties he forgot to uh register with the ethics commissioner um you know we're talking three years after the fact that he is already the uh, minister of finance that he owned a, a, a million dollar chalet or multi-million dollar chalet uh, in France. Uh, so, you know, his properties in the French Riviera didn't even get, you know, registered uh, with, with the ethics commissioner until he got caught. And he again made the claim, oh, I forgot. And here we have now, you know, Bill Marno just says, oh, I forgot, I'm sorry. You know what, once, you know, maybe I can buy it that, that was done by by accident two times that this is beyond getting sorry this is that um you have no uh ethics uh your, your scruples have been compromised and i think we have to really question that is this part of the liberal culture especially of cabinet that they just feel that they are entitled to their entitlements like david dingwall um so you know, we're going to keep driving this hard. Uh, we're going to find out, you know, what exactly uh, the We Charity would get if they actually had received the money and the forty-three and a half million dollars to administrate that program. Uh, I think there needs to be a closer look at that the, the, the charity's operations. Uh, we've also raised the concern that some of the uh, videos that they've produced and going back to twenty seventeen and. And before it looked a lot like uh, electioneering for the liberals. Uh, it looked like third party support, which again uh, has to be claimed. Uh, and then it has to be capped at a certain level. And if you're over that, then you're in violations of the Elections Canada Act. Uh, Act. So, you know, we have a, a great team there on this. I have to give kudos to, to people like Michael Barrett, uh, my colleague, and, and Pierre Polyev, who have been really hammering hard on this at the Ethics uh, Committee and in the Finance Committee, and of course, uh, when we do have uh, sittings, whether it's actual sittings like we had Monday, Tuesday in the House, or what we had today with, again, a special COVID committee that's done uh, both combination of virtual and uh, real. Now, uh, let's get to some of the questions that, that uh, have, has been asked. Um, and I tell you, I, I get uh, Mike asks, what are some of the real solutions you're working on to get us rural Manitoba uh, access to high speed internet and cell coverage? And, um, you know, I am a, a, a rural Manitoban uh, where I live here. My cell coverage is intermittent at best. I'm just on the edge of coverage. Uh, I tell people normally uh, to, to actually call me on my landline. I still have a landline because we don't have good cell coverage. We used to when uh, MTS and Rogers ran out, ran off a tower only a mile from, not even a mile, half a mile from, from my house here, but they all moved onto a new tower, which is about 10 miles from here. And and I just don't have that that uh, coverage anymore. We even tried putting a booster on the host and that uh, hasn't worked very well either. But um, we as conservatives have been uh, working quite diligently on trying to find a solution. We have actually asked uh, people to, to give feedback. Michelle Rempel has led the charge uh, on looking at what needs to be done. Uh, we need a solution and a plan on how to get increased cell coverage and uh, broadband internet services across this country so that rural Canada has the same services available to it as anyone that lives in an urban setting. Uh, we're not second class citizens. Uh, so uh, CRTC is going to have to look at how they deal with the sale of, of things like uh, the spectrum 
Uh, the way they, we've done it in the past hasn't worked in, in selling it off to the big uh, multinational uh, or national uh, conglomerates like Rogers and Bell and, and TELUS. Uh, what we need to actually see happen is that spectrum um, being broken down to sale into smaller packages so people that uh, businesses that want to provide cell coverage into, into underserved areas can. Uh, CRTC has a role uh, in, in also providing the mandate and the licensing and the policy to uh, provide better uh, cross Canada cell coverage. And the same is true on broadband. Uh, this is now an essential service that uh, everybody deserves to have internet access. So we'll continue to uh, put the hard questions against the Liberals. Uh, they don't hold a lot of seats in rural Canada, so maybe they are more uh, apathetic. Uh, and uh, don't really care uh, what, what happens in, in rural Canada. But, uh, you know, we have a rural internet caucus. We will continue to, to put, put up the fight and put the pressure on both CRTC and on the Liberals to ensure that any federal dollars that are being spent on infrastructure go to underserved or non-served areas, and uh, which hasn't been the case in, uh, always in the past. Uh, and secondly, is that if the big um, companies aren't prepared to do provide that that cell coverage, uh, you know, as we move from 4G up to 5G, but you know, a lot of us don't even have 3G, uh, let's um, push forward to get that done through smaller companies who are more than willing uh, to put up that uh, infrastructure and in, uh, put those towers in place. Uh, develop that client's uh, service basis, and then ultimately, uh, all this will have uh, not just being tie into having just one or two companies to choose from, but we'll have true competition. So uh, I, I guarantee you that um, uh, that uh, the Conservative Caucus are fighting hard uh, to try to get this rectified, uh, and we've put uh, a, a deadline in place and. Um, Megan, if you can actually throw up on, on the screen at some point, but there is uh, uh, a report that we did up as, as caucus, Michelle Rempel uh, provided it to the minister and there was a timeline attached to that and uh, that we wanted something done by 2021. Um, so I, uh, you know, we have to continue to uh, uh, drive that home. And of course, each and every one of you that uh, still are not getting this, uh, uh, you know, coverage that 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 uh, is, you know, good for streaming is good for being able to do these Facebook live events or Zoom calls, or if you're dealing with, uh, you know, trying to do FaceTime with your family, uh, make sure that uh, you, you don't just send letters to your local MP. Make sure you're also talking to uh, liberal MPs as well. Send the, copy those emails into the, them, right to the ministers, uh, and make sure that that this happens. So, Minister of Industry, of course, is is the main person in charge of this, uh, and and that is uh, Nav Deep Baines. Uh, Allison, thank you for uh, liking my uh, loft background. Uh, that's uh, naughty pine that we uh, put up in our loft here, and. Uh, you know, this is uh, where I decided to set up my office a number of years ago, even be, uh, when I first entered politics. And then ultimately with all our mobile devices, I hardly ever was making use of it. But uh, now with working from home, it was, uh, it's definitely more comfortable to be up here at the desk uh, and, and doing my job uh, every day. Now, Dave and Tyler are asking now, uh, where are our veterans benefits? We're dying here. And when will the government finally step up to the plate for veterans like us? They served in Afghanistan and many other deployments. So first and foremost, to both you and to all veterans who are watching and to those who are currently serving, thank you for your service. And I, I don't mean that as a platitude. I sincerely believe that uh, the job that I do as a politician is impossible uh, without uh, the sacrifice that has been made uh, by those that have served in uniform in the past and those that serve today. Uh, and I've always um, held true to the covenant that was made by um, uh, the, the, back in, in World War I. Uh, where uh, Prime Minister, um, I want to say Barlow, <laughs> not Parthel, 
uh, it'll come to me. Anyway, he, he, he made the promise that, that those that, that, uh, you know, it was done on the fields of Vimy Ridge, uh, uh, that those that go out and fight for their country, the country will be there to fight for them. And uh, our World War One, World War Two, Korean vets uh, for sure received uh, benefits that uh, most modern day vets will tell you were superior. And I know that uh, we need to continue to drive home with uh, other politicians that we have to have. Uh, Robert Borden, thank you, Megan, for Prime Minister Robert Borden, our the Conservative uh, Prime Minister during World War One. Uh, so Robert Borden made that commitment, and that's the sacred covenant that a lot of people always refer to between the government of Canada and uh, to, to our veterans. And so uh, what we're dealing with right now is, you know, uh, the tinkering that Seamus Reagan did when he was Minister of Veterans Affairs. That was really a shell game of taking uh, certain veteran benefits and trying to shove them over into another program. Uh, it uh, did improve benefits for some vets and it made it worse for others. Uh, so those things need to be fixed. Uh, there needs to be, again, a, a revamp of, of those um, veterans benefits, not necessarily the pension side of it, but on, on, on the benefits that, that they have because of things like uh, injury attributable to service. The other problem that we have right now more than anything is despite the fact that the Liberals have said that they fixed the backlog in Veterans Affairs, that backlog continues to increase. And I know that some people uh, have, have uh, you know, said that uh, my explanation on it uh, last uh, uh, Facebook Live event wasn't good enough. But I can tell you that we have most people in Veterans Affairs Canada, not just in Charlottetown, but across Canada, but especially those uh, offices in Ontario and Quebec where they're still working from home, don't have the same access to the files that they would when they're in the office. Uh, the, and I know this for a fact with national defense, only so many of them have uh, RCA secure cards so that they can access their uh, private and confidential information. Uh, we know that when it comes to issues of, of national security and a lot of vets have files that are, are considered national security because of what they, where they've been and what they know, uh, you're not going to access those easily from home. And so those applications, uh, are, a lot of them are being done online and those are the ones that seem to be getting dealt with. But the ones that are being done on paper and those that, those ones that, that uh, are being mediated because all too often we see Veterans Affairs uh, acting more as a gatekeeper than actually trying to get benefits into the hands of veterans. Um, you know, they aren't um, having the same ability to, you know, uh, that they would if they're sitting in the office uh, you know, five days a week, working Monday to Friday, nine to five. But that's that's why we are seeing that backlog increase. But there is a way to remedy it. Get people back to work, open up the offices again, and hire more staff to clear away this backlog. Uh, that's the only way it's going to happen. Uh, Judy and Pat uh, ask a question about uh, freedom of thought, opinion, and speech is paramount to our free democracy. It appears these are under threat and people have been ostracized and called racists for stating their opinion. What action can the Conservative Party enforce against these harmful practices? Look at our charter rights, which includes freedom of expression, uh, our core to who we are as Canadians. Uh, freedom of speech is the core to our principles as conservatives and uh, our conservative party will always fight for them although there's other political parties that will not uh, so you know we are still the only party in the house of commons that allows members of parliament to be able to vote their caucuses on issues of morality and on faith and belief and uh, so when it comes down to those personal issues of conscience only the conservatives will allow free votes. But I can tell you that, uh, you know, we do have uh, a group out there called Antifa, uh, which is, they call themselves anti-fascists, and they see anyone that takes a, uh, any position opposed to them, that uh, essentially that uh, we're all racists or bigots or uh, call, call us um, all sorts of names. Um, <coughs> But we know that, that this left-wing extremist group 
are a bunch of anarchists. Um, they are the ones that are trying to revise history. They're the ones that were throwing pink paint on uh, the statue of Sir John A. Macdonald uh, this past weekend. Look at the founders of our nation, Canada, weren't perfect, but they created a great country. And Canada wouldn't exist if it wasn't for people like, you know, Sir John A. Macdonald, you know, uh, Jacques Etienne Cartier, uh, you know, Langevin, you know, all, all these uh, great individuals. Um, I think I'm having some connectivity issues, uh, so there we go. Is it any better? Let me do a speed test. <coughs> My download speed's pretty good. Thirty-eight. That's my upload. Ooh. Ten, eleven. Okay. Well, I'm just wondering, Megan, um, are you recording this? Because it could be the memory. Yeah. Sorry about that, people. Um, so, okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, Kim asked, how come frontline workers um, haven't gotten their relief benefit yet? No one has answers to when that will be. Um, so I understand you're talking about the Manitoba Risk Recognition Program. Uh, that is funded partially by the federal government, but it's administered by the Manitoba uh, government, the province of Manitoba. So I encourage you to make sure you talk to your MLA. Uh, and if you don't know who that is, uh, make sure you give us a, a call or send us an email and uh, we'll let you know uh, who your MLA is. Uh, but I know that the application window is closed. I know that uh, the province should be cutting checks pretty soon. There was a revamp on that originally what, what they promised based upon hours uh, was increased. Um, but uh, we'll have to just uh, wait and see when they actually get the money out. But they I think the way they changed it, it will be more beneficial to more Manitobans. So uh, Gray asks, are the RCMP going to investigate this WE scandal? I can tell you that uh, we have asked the RCMP to look into this uh, as a criminal investigation. Uh, but ultimately it's up to the discretion of the RCMP. Trina asks, the Liberal government announced a $60 benefit for people living with disabilities. Do you have any updates or kind of assume another false promise from them? So just so you know, uh, the Liberals original push to have the disability tax credit, uh, those that, that qualify for it uh, would receive another $600. Um, that was uh, of course tied to an omnibus bill uh, back in July, or back in June, I should say, that uh, failed to move forward, not because of the disability tax credit, but because the Liberals wanted to bring forward criminality charges for anyone uh, who uh, were double dipping into uh, um, the CERB benefit. Uh, of course, Block and, and NDP uh, didn't want to uh, criminalize those that may have unknowingly uh, committed fraud. Um, we were kind of concerned about some of the other aspects of the program and not getting answers, especially where we were on budgets. So that came back now as Bill C-20. That's what we debated in the House on Monday and Tuesday. It was passed last night. Uh, so that does include the one-time $600 payment for persons with disability. So again, you have to have a certificate for your disability tax credit to be eligible. Uh, and um, if you don't have one, you need to have one in your possession for at least 60 days after this bill receives uh, royal assent, which should be fairly quick. Um, it also uh, is, will provide uh, people who are on CPP disability or the Quebec Pension Plan disability benefits will get it, as well as if you're getting disability benefits from Veterans Affairs Canada, this will also be paid out to those vets as well. 
So we did see improvements because there was questions asked around uh, this uh, special payment and uh, money will be flowing, I would hope sooner than later. Uh, so uh, also we're getting a lot of email questions. Um, my staff asked me to make sure uh, people that are asking about changes to quarantine here in Manitoba and any other restrictions from a standpoint of interprovincial travel. Again, I urge you to reach out to your MLAs, to the provincial government, uh, and uh, Megan will put up the link uh, for Engage Manitoba for the phase four restoring safe services. Uh, but that uh, is up now in the link comment and uh, make sure you uh, take a look at that and that'll give you more information about whether or not travel is going to uh, going to change. And now I'm getting questions about my microphone. The microphone is all the way in. Let me take it out, plug it back in. I do this from the office. If this is it becomes a problem. Okay, let me just check microphone. So I got it's coming from my side that I got low system resources affecting audio quality. Okay, let me just do something here quick. I got to close some. I'll be right back. I got to close off the stuff. And Uh, okay, I'll just keep on going. Uh, hopefully this will improve. I shut off some of my programs that were running. Okay, uh, so Joey asks, why can't liberals answer a simple question? Today or yesterday, she asked them three times, but we and, uh, you know, Trudeau danced around it. Well, that's what Trudeau does. He doesn't actually answer uh, the question. Uh, so we do have him coming to committee. This will be uh, something that is um, new. We don't very often get prime ministers to appear before committees, so like finance committee. So uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Pierre Pauly have taken on, uh, taken on Trudeau uh, right through. Uh, Shirley asks, what's your position on mandatory vaccines? I'm not, I'm not in favor of mandatory vaccines. I think that all vaccines should be, be uh, optional. It's up to families to make those decisions on whether or not they vaccinate. But, I'll, but I do believe in vaccination. I believe vaccinations uh, have worked uh, incredibly well. Uh, we've got rid of polio because of vac vaccinations. And as soon as people quit vaccinating, we started seeing cases again. Uh, the same in, uh, with with other vaccines have been very, very effective. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing um, COVID-19 actually have a vaccine come forward. And I'll be encouraging people to actually go out and get vaccinated. But I don't think that anybody should be forced to take a vaccine if they don't believe in it. Uh, so again, uh, I'm gonna close off here. Uh, again, people are asking why, why Peter McKay. I'll just say, say this, look at folks, uh, I'm just one vote. Uh, I believe strongly in the man. Uh, he, he and I are friends. We've been together since uh, 2014, or since 2004, since I first got elected. Uh, he came and he's helped me not numerous times when I was an MP, uh, taking on uh, serious election fights against people like uh, Ed Schreier when he uh, challenged me uh, for the um, honor to be a member of parliament for Selkirk and Lake Eastman. I also would say this, that uh, half the stuff that's been said about Peter online is, is crap. Um, one, this guy is a solid conservative. Uh, he is a fiscal conservative. He is tough on crime. He's a military hawk. He's a foreign policy um, uh, principled individual. And I, he is also someone that, um, you know, he uh, is a statesman. and. Uh, 
has the experience that we need right now. This country desperately needs somebody with experience at the helm. And, uh, you know, some of the stories that, that are out there are complete uh, libelous, uh, including some of the people on this team, uh, which uh, are insulting. Some of them don't even, you know, there's the one about Muslim Brotherhood. Like, that individual isn't even, uh, that, that's named isn't even the person that's in the, the pictures and videos that are out there. It's a different person altogether. So uh, to just make up stuff and throw it out there, um, that's fake news. Uh, so for all of you as conservative members, if you have your ballots, please uh, make sure you, you mark in your favorites as a preferential ballot. Uh, mail them back in. Uh, the deadline is August 21st to have ballots in the hands of the party. So you don't want to leave it till after August 10th. Uh, as soon as you get your ballots, mark them, mail them uh, is the best thing to do. And of course, I still firmly believe that Peter McKay is not only the person with the experience and with the strong conservative uh, principles and values that we all share, uh, he's also the only individual in the race that can beat Justin Trudeau, and we have to get rid of Trudeau. He's the one destroying our country. And Peter wins where we have to win to form government. We have to win another 50 seats, and there isn't 50 seats left out in Western Canada for us to win. Uh, a couple of seats in Winnipeg, if we're, if we're having a good, good election, we'll have... Um, uh, you know, a handful of seats around Vancouver that we can pick up, but that still leaves us 45 seats short. And that means that we have to win where we don't have seats. That's the GTA, that's Atlanta, Canada, that's uh, picking up a couple of seats in Quebec. And Peter can do it for us. I know that. I just want to say hi to uh, one of my uh, provincial colleagues, Doyle Panouk. Uh, Doyle and I actually grew up in the same part of Manitoba, out in the Parkland region uh, along the Manitoba Saskatchewan border. Um, Inglis and Drotmore, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful part of the world. And Doyle, you're doing a great job. So uh, let me just uh, wrap up by, by saying this, that if you have any spe specific questions that we can get to, uh, if you had trouble hearing parts of this because of my connectivity problems and whether it was uh, my broadband or whether it was actually my computer uh, running a little bit slow, uh, we will um, uh, try to get uh, some clarity to you on that. Um, you know, we have been getting unprecedented numbers of emails and phone calls, uh, but as constituents, each and every one of you matter. Uh, we always try to get back to you as quickly as possible. Now, um, you know, I always enjoy this type of format for answering questions. We're going to continue to do this uh, once a month going forward. Uh, I also want to just make sure that all of you are aware that uh, for those of you that live in the riding self of Aaron Lake Eastman, if you want to receive our e-newsletter, um, that we send out. I do one, you know, to the Conservative members that I do as, as, as the candidate of record and as a member of Parliament. I also do one strictly as an MP that goes to all constituents. Um, so if you want to receive that, make sure you forward in your email to my office so that we can put you into the database. You know, out of the, the 67,000 households that we have in the writing, I think we only have about four or 5,000 emails that uh, have been provided to us by our constituents. Um, but you can also uh you know get it make sure you also provide us with your name your postal code uh, along with your email address so that we can uh, uh, make sure that we have all your data uh, on file and uh i'll just say that uh you know, i appreciate you guys all being here i appreciate all that you're doing and uh, trying to control COVID 19. uh it's not easy times uh, i know that uh, things here in manitoba are a lot better than say other uh, regions of the country where they continue to deal with increasing numbers. But follow the advice of our public health officials. Uh, and, you know, I know that, uh, you know, since last time we, we spoke, we celebrated our uh, Canada Day and we also celebrated Manitoba Day and that was Manitoba's 150th birthday. So all of you as Manitobans, happy 150th, you look fantastic. And with that, uh, we'll talk again soon.